Today, my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today we are gonna walk through the nine recommended founding documents that are a part of the AP government exam. And I'm super excited because when we do this today, we're gonna have lots of questions from you all and we're able to handle it because we brought in lots of support today. So number one, David Olson. David, you wanna wave to everybody? That is David Olson. He's one of our teachers advisory uh, board members. He helps run the Teachers Advisory Council. If you want to learn more about that, we can send you information about that if you're a teacher. But he's also a fantastic AP teacher from Madison, Wisconsin. So he's going to be handling the Q&A. So all your AP questions students, ask him. He'll give you lots of tips, lots of pointers, and lots of connecting dots between what Nicholas is, is going to go through, what questions I'm going to ask, and the exam. But we're also here with one of our constitutional scholars, Nicholas Mosvick. Okay, Nicholas, it's your turn to wave. And no, to say everybody... that I'm a natural rival of David because I'm from Minnesota. Ah, oh, look at me! I'm getting. Told. I wasn't allowed to Nick. go to Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> Nick, I'm a I'm a native Minnesotan. I'm, I'm I live in the land of cheese well, under duress, Nicholas. Your parents should have banned you from going there. Then what happened? <laughs> uh, graduate I, school. Of bands. <laughs> graduate school always. So That's let's get right. started. I will represent the East Coast here from yeah. Philadelphia. Uh, Nicholas, we have a lot to go through today and some really great, great kind of key documents. And this is going to be good for students who aren't even taking the test. So remember, students, if you are taking the test, you got this. You can do it. Remember to breathe. If you're not taking this test, it's okay. It's great for all of us to learn this material. So let's begin in kind of timeline order with the Declaration of Independence. Nicholas, Declaration of Independence. What are the key ideas here? And what are some of the key components the students should keep an eye on when they're taking the test? Yeah, so we have to give them the date first. So they need to know July 4th, 1776. Although if you're John Adams, you say more, May 14th or July 2nd. <laughs> depending, depending on who you ask, but the point there is there's a process here, which is actually something to keep in mind. We can joke a little bit about why John Adams thought that, but uh, I think it's that there was a process. Um, to why the declaration and how it got drafted and why the words that were in it. Um, I think the big takeaway here, and we put it earlier today, right, is there's two things going on here. So one is Jefferson's language, kind of the high language about natural rights, uh, all men are created equal, endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, uh, among them life, liberty, and the pursuits of happiness. Um, so we have that language. And then we have the list of grievances, right? Which is uh, one, it is that it's a list of grievances, but who is it against? It's against the king. This is a declaration. So it's, it's to declare to the world and to the king of England independence on the part of the colonies to create a new nation. And here's the reasons why. First off, we have natural rights. We just listed some of them. All men are created equal. Uh, we, we have these inalienable rights. And what? And they've been violated by the king and by parliament. How have they been violated? Well, here's a list of all the violations. Um, you could go through all of them. We talk about them all the time. The Bill of Rights talks about them in some respects, right? Because we're talking about things like unreasonable searches and seizures and quartering of soldiers in the home and standing armies and all that. And uh, so those, those are the complaints. And uh, the idea is that's a reason why we can dec declare independence. Um, the other piece we talked about earlier today, I think that's important is that um, Jefferson wasn't doing this alone, both in the sense of where he got ideas from, but also literally he wasn't alone because there was a committee of five. Uh, so there are five individuals who were assigned to write the declaration. Benjamin Franklin and John Adams were among them. Robert Morris and Roger Sherman were the other two. And uh, Jefferson was the main drafter, but he had editors. And he was taking from John Locke, from Enlightenment thinkers, but also other Americans and colonists who had been writing for years about the independence movement about these ideas of natural liberty. Um, so I think Curry, that's probably the the, the biggest points yeah. here that we want to bring out. 
And I think it's really important to think of this as the, the summary of all this energy, ideas, grievances, and change that's going on at the time. And Nicholas, you said that this at the end of the last time we taught this class that I absolutely want to hold on to is that it is groundbreaking, this document, mm. and it's yeah. very, very visionary. So as we go through all these next um, founding documents, you're going to see that we're trying to keep parsing out how do we live up to these visionary ideas that we all had in the beginning and not just Jefferson had, but many people did. Yeah, we didn't start those well two though. two pieces, right, is one yeah. is global. So this is shared to the world and it inspires other revolutions and other governments and similar documents, um, including in Latin America, but even in the Haitian rebe um, rebellion and revolution. Um, but it's, yeah, it's the high ideals that are hard to live up to and how, how, how do we end up doing that? And, uh, I think that leads us to popular sovereignty in the next two documents in the sense of, okay, so we have a new government and a new nation. What does it look like? And it wasn't so great, right? Like when we get in the articles, we can say we had a big stumbling to, yeah. to begin with. <laughs> Well, it, you know, it had a minority of defenders, right? We, we, we have to point that out. Not everybody hated the Articles of Confederation, just a lot of people did. The majority of Americans <laughs> did. That's one of the things they could agree on is it caused a lot of problems. Uh, so you can see by when it was approved and ratified, this was happening during the Revolutionary War. So the Articles of Confederation was that first national government that was running things during the war. That's important, um, not just for context, but but for experience. So for George Washington, Alexander Hamilton and others who were involved in the war, in the fighting, they experienced just how little power Congress had, which is to say the national government under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they couldn't really tax. Um, they couldn't really declare war adequately. They couldn't pay the army. So they could approve George Washington as commander, but then they couldn't supply the army. They couldn't really do a lot. They could. All they could do is ask states to provide enough militia men and to pay them and to arm them. They couldn't really do a lot on their own. And that led to not just frustration, but near multiple times a rebellion from the army itself. So it was bad, right? So there was that problem. There was the problem that they couldn't really make adequate treaties because there wasn't an executive. And the war debts, we like to talk about that too, because that gets the Shays Rebellion. But all that is to say is that well, Congress couldn't really regulate the economy. They couldn't really tax. So when it came to something like millions of dollars worth of war debt, it was left to the states to figure it out and they couldn't really do that by themselves. So that all points us to the constitution. I think the other big point we made was, and this gets us to the constitution too, is it was impossible to, to amend. It required mm -hmm. all 13 states. And we have instances in which an amendment got 12 of 13 and still didn't pass. So as we Why think about that- Why does that get us to the constitution? Yeah. You can set that up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was so easy. It's so easy today, Nicholas. So that's great. So when we first look at the constitution, we know that article five is the amendment oh. process. So thank you for that awesome connecting the yeah. dots. But what I wanna do first with the students is look at the constitutional convention and the structural constitution and e what each branch, article one, two, and three in particular, what roles they have and how they work together. And then I'm going to just tell the students, we're going to parse out the Bill of Rights in a minute. We're going to put that after the, the um, Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist and the ratification debates, because I think it makes much more sense in a timeline to do it that way. So let's start with what does the Constitution say? What does it kind of lead with? And then what are the, the roles of the branches and how is that defined in this original or structural Constitution? Yeah, so we remember, right, that the structural constitution, the job we're doing here is we're trying to create a more, uh, generally the federalists believe this, right, those who support the constitution, wanted a stronger central national government, but with limited powers, right? In other words, the structure was both designed to give all these powers that they didn't have under the articles, but to also not take too much from the states or the people, right? So they're limited, but also... Back, uh, stronger than they were before. Uh, Article one, that's the legislative branch. So that's Congress. Big things to remember there, right, is bicameralism. It's two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, they do different things. We don't have time here to get into those key differences, but it's worth at least pointing that out. 
and their job is to make laws, right? Article one not only lays out how they do it, but the various powers they have, including some of the things we just talked about, like declaring war, raising and supporting armies, uh, laying certain kinds of taxes, and then the Commerce Clause gives them power to regulate the economy. So those are pretty the pretty important ones, and they're all laid out in Article One. Article Two, that's the executive power. We also know that as the presidency. Um, generally, executive power is the power to carry out laws or to execute commands. That's what executive power means. And so inherent in that is the question of whether that not that means just strictly carrying out Congress's laws, or is it give the president some other powers to interpret and to figure out what those laws mean and to execute them. That matters today, Curry, as we've talked about earlier, because we now have lots of executive agencies without getting too much into administrative law or anything. That's to say is that's a sharing of power between Congress and the presidency, because Congress gives a lot of these executive agencies powers to interpret and make rules and other things that are a different kind of creature of the law. And so that is its own form of sharing of power. And that brings about a lot of important questions. Article so, three, that's the judiciary. So that's where we get the Supreme Court, but also the lower federal courts. And generally we're talking about the job of interpreting the laws and interpreting the constitution, which what I just said there, keep in mind, those are two different things. There are the laws passed by Congress and carried out by the executive. And then there is the fundamental law of the constitution. And the question is, do those things comport with the requirements of the constitution? Awesome. Now this, the structural constitution is signed by most of them on yeah. September 17th, 1787. Three, right? Your favorite three. <laughs> my favorite three. You can talk about my favorite three and what they decide to do and how that kicks off the ratification discussion and leads us to all these Federalist Papers that my cat is really excited about. <laughs> um, yes. So go for the, um, it, we'll, we'll begin with not just Madison, we'll skip the Bill of Rights, but the Federalist Papers, but not these three, the other yeah. three, the dissenters. Yeah, yeah, the dissenters, the three, Elbridge, Gary, um, George Mason, and, and Edmund Randolph, who wouldn't sign the Constitution and why they wouldn't and the big reasons generally were there wasn't a bill of rights and they thought the states were losing too much power and the federal government was too powerful generally speaking and uh that does set off the debate because it's kind of the anti-federalists those who oppose ratification who have the first word to some extent and so the federalist papers are a product of that ratification debate so as curry said you're keeping in mind that yes these uh, 55 men in Philadelphia signed, most of them, right, 41 ultimately signed the document, but then it's presented to the people to, to, uh, to ratify or to not ratify it, and they do it through these state conventions. Well, there's a lot of opposition. Um, there's a lot of opposition. In many states, it's very close, and the Constitution nearly doesn't pass. Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and New York, so in Hamilton's home state, there is majority opposition at the state convention to the constitution initially. So for them, there's kind of that, that panic that this might not pass. So the Federalist paper, uh, papers, they're published in New York papers. The Federalists control the majority of newspapers and that's the place where they can get their voice out and say, hey, we heard your concerns, we heard your criticism, here's why you're wrong and here's why we should ratify this constitution. So think of this as like, maybe not, it's not a moment of panic necessarily, but it is the sense of, okay, this could actually go the other way. We really need to try to convince people that it's in their interest to ratify the constitution. So that brings us to James Madison, who writes the first two Federalist Papers that we need to talk about. John Jay, you saw there, um, I think someone this morning put in the chat, he got sick at some point, so he couldn't continue to write a lot of them. So it's mostly Madison and Hamilton, Here's how you know, by the way, for your AP exam, how you can remember if it's Madison or Hamilton. Madison, political theory. He's got the big ideas, the big structure, right? Hamilton is talking about kind of the specifics, the courts, the presidency, right? So if that helps at all to know who is writing what, um, kind of connect them to those things. So Federalist 10 is asked 
is answering the big question. And that is, okay, anti-federalists are saying large republics, everyone who's written on this, back to the Greeks and the Romans and then Montesquieu and the Enlightenment uh, theorists have said large republics don't work. Republican government has to be small and close to the people. So what say you, Madison? Madison says, they, they got it wrong. I've thought about this and I have a new idea. And the new idea is actually a larger republic is better. And that's because we have to build in an assumption that as much as virtue is important, a lot of individuals will act in self-interest. And so therefore we have to build a structure that seeks to benefit all of us and reduce that factionalism, as he would call it. So he says a large republic, it's actually really hard for factions to build coalitions and to get things passed. It works against them because there's too many interest groups out there. Keep in mind, a faction that doesn't have to be a political party, it can just be any set of interests or interest group that isn't aligned with the greater interest or the common good, right? And that means... So he he's first spells out like factions are bad. The bigger, the better. This will work but, in our But they're favor. inherent. Yeah. And you then, can't get rid of them as this point, right? Yeah. So they're natural, but you this system will will really suppress that that urgency in humans to do this action. It will stop it. But there when we look at Federalist 51. Well, he's saying that we can't stop it. But what we have to do is build a structure that best utilizes that natural human tendency in politics. So he's like, he's okay, being so a cynic, remember? <laughs> yeah, always. Uh, Madison the cynic, but always saying, like, here's a way to channel it. And then when we look at Federalist 51, so 10 and 51 go so nicely together, because 51 saying, well, here's a way we can set up the government. Yep. So this channels that energy again and says, people like to be in charge. So give them a way to check each other by being in charge. So they're such a good combo together. Yeah, and that's the, the great quote, which we used earlier and we'll use again, which is that Madison says, well, look, I mean, if uh, men were angels, we wouldn't need government. But Madison's point is they're not. And therefore we have to assume, again, we want virtue. It's not that we don't want virtue. We want virtuous leaders. We want virtuous people, but we can't assume it. We have to assume that self-interest. And in his point is that means even in government. So we hope, Supreme Court members, we hope the president, we hope members of Congress have virtuous interest in heart, but they may not. So what we want is to make them act um, against the interests of the other branches, to compete with them, right? He's saying, use that desire for natural competition and self-interest to keep no branch from getting too powerful or too strong because they have to compete with each other. That's the structure. That's the idea, right? Sharing power checks and balances alongside separation of powers ensures that no branch gets too powerful because it assumes that they will compete with each other. And one thing I'm gonna ask you, Nicholas, and I don't think we've talked about this before, but I think it's really important. So in a way, this system that Madison was propo like proposed in the checks and balances in our constitution that were eventually ratified, they set up almost a collisions between the branches and that's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah, it's that other piece of that quote, right, that you, you shared. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Remember that, right? Because again, Madison's point is, if people who will be in government will probably be ambitious. We Got have it. to assume that. We can't create a government that will get rid of ambition. What is that? So we need a government that is structured to use that in order to limit the things that government will do, right? Is to say, was, we don't want tyranny. We want effective government. So channel right? Those it. are different things. How do we do that? We have to have, as you said, that structure in which they actually kind of go at each other a little bit, right? Yeah, and I think that's really important. Now, almost like the opposite of that, but still on the same side, Hamilton comes in with, yeah. but, but wait, there is one branch that should be very strongly focused in one. Well, I think, I think Hamilton's adding on, right? He's coming from a different angle, but I don't think he's disagreeing. I think Hamilton is talking less about kind of the fallacy of human nature, but he's also saying- In practice. I mean, yeah, we're gonna have in, we, we want the president to represent the people. We do want that. But his point is, would be what we really need is energy and dispatch 
in the executive branch. If that's because they're ambitious and they're countering the other branches, that's, that's fine. But the point is we also need, again, what Hamilton is saying is the same as Madison, is what we want is effective government, not tyrannical government. And a, a strong, energetic president will accomplish that. Because in Hamilton's mind, the more energetic and effective that single president is, is an embodiment of the people, the better the president will be at checking the other branches, but also carrying out um, his or her constitutional duties, right? Um, because that's, he's, he's trying to counter the people who also wanted like a plural executive, right? Which would be like a council or multiple people, even members of the Supreme Court potentially. Well, Hamilton's kind of like Madison in the sense that he's saying, well, we've had experience with that. That doesn't really work. And part of the reason is not only are they not energetic, that they're not responsible to the people. The people wanna be able to look at that single president and say, they're responsible for carrying out these laws and exec executing them properly and representing the people. So it's not just, it's duty, power and responsibility all together. And it's Hamilton saying a single executive is better for doing that. And students remember, as you're taking the test, you're clarifying what the role of that branch is Yep. and then giving evidence with these documents of where the ideas came from. So when we look at next, we'll go to the courts and we'll look at Hamilton in Federalist 78. Yeah, and I think I, I don't know, and I said this last time, right, is that remember that Hamilton's also saying, look, a, a well-structured uh, government and constitution, even a stronger government is going to protect liberty better. Now, I just explained why an energetic executive will do that, let me tell you why a properly structured Supreme Court can do that too, right? So yeah, he's talking about the judiciary generally, but in 70, Federal 78, he's really talking about the Supreme Court. And he's saying there's two really important things here to remember. One is independence is really key, right? Hamilton's saying, we had to learn from the British government that when the king controls the judges, that leads to corruption and tyranny, it's bad. So we need independent justices who are appointed for life and, and, and except for in a very small instance, they could be impeached, right? As to say, uh, upon good behavior is the constitution put it that. But the point is, it's really hard to get rid of the Supreme Court justice. And Hamilton's saying is that's the point because we want the best people to be appointed and then to have independence so that neither of the other branches can do anything to control them or to tell them what to do. And that links to their duty and power, which is the second component, right? And Hamilton's saying rather famously, well, the judiciary is the weakest branch of the three, but because they have neither the force nor will, as he puts it, but they have a really important duty. And that's checking the other branches by reviewing to make sure the acts of Congress and the president comport with the constitution. And that's important because the people themselves through popular sovereignty have ratified this document, if they do ratify it, by the way, right? Because we're yeah. he's speaking to people who haven't done it yet. It means that the court ensures that they are sticking with the people's document, which is fundamental law, right? So I think you want to bring all those threads together. Awesome. Uh, okay, so next, finally, a word from the Anti-Federalists. They don't get enough yes. attention here, but we will give them real quick attention on Brutus number one, speaking for the Anti-Federalists. And then we have two more documents to go, two more documents to go over after that. Yes. And as Curry said, our minor complaint is uh, <laughs> we could have more Anti-Federalists because Brutus isn't the only one. As I already mentioned, there is a lot of opposition to the Constitution and uh, the ratification contest is closed. So we're kind of saying here, well, why is it that it was close? Why were people so persuaded by it? So what does Brutus say that is so interesting as an argument that's worth taking note of? Well, he's setting up the challenge that Madison has to answer in Federalist 10. Because what Brutus is saying is, I don't trust a large republic. You can tell me you have a new theory, but whether it's Montesquieu or the Greeks or the Romans or any of the great political theorists, they would say that only smaller republics work. And the reason is they're closer to the people. They can better protect their liberties. And uh, so Brutus thinks uh, a stronger centralized national government is 
going to tend towards tyranny. And one of the reasons they're going to do so is this notion they call consolidation. And by that, they mean over time, there will be a tendency of the national government to increase its power and to take it away from the states and the people. And they'll work together to do this, right? So what Brutus is saying and other anti-federalists are saying is, well, we don't trust this Federalist 51 theory of checks and balances and separation of powers. We, tr we, we trust the old theory because what we think is actually the branches will work together in kind of a cabal or an aristocracy, particularly with the Senate and the president, but also the Supreme Court. And they'll work together to give themselves more power, right? Because they want to accrue power. So the Supreme Court will uphold Congress passing unconstitutional legislation because it will give them a role in power in doing so. That was the way that they saw this, right? All and working all, together. And it, all this energy, all this back and forth leads us to the actual proposal and ratification of the Bill of Rights. Um, and it, you pointed out this out before, but it made me laugh that the anti-federalists are the ones that really are the energy behind getting of a Bill of Rights, but it's really not what they wanted at the end. <laughs> no, no, they're just, a lot of them are disappointed. And even the ones that are in Congress are writing to each other and saying, what is this? You know, Richard Henry Lee, one of the most notable anti-federalists is appalled. He thinks it's basically, uh, you know, useless. <laughs> but this, this isn't what we wanted. Well, what is it that what they wanted, right? Is while the anti-federalists wanted the Bill of Rights, not just to list individual liberties that should be protected, but in order to limit the power of the federal government, right? That was kind of big in their mind is that constitution made the federal government too powerful. So they wanted to limit a lot of that power as best they could. So they wanted structural limitations and changes. Madison didn't want that. Madison initially didn't really support a Bill of Rights because most of the Federalists thought, well, we don't need a Bill of Rights. We have a structural constitution. That's what protects liberty. It's what Hamilton said, right? Um, so don't go listing rights. But Madison is persuaded for a variety of reasons, in part because anti-Federalists threatened to have a second convention. And Madison doesn't want that. So he writes the Bill of Rights and he bases it on a variety of things, including state bills of rights and declarations of rights. And uh, he doesn't really write in a lot of those structural limitations, things like no standing armies in times of peace. That doesn't uh, end up in the Bill of Rights that's presented to the states. Um, there are other things and we can't, we don't have time to go through them. But the point is that the anti-federalists didn't really think all the things that they wanted made it to the final document. And it's largely because they weren't in uh, total control of the process. And the Bill of Rights is, is generally winds up being a listing of rights to protect individuals from the federal government. That's kind of yeah. the, it, when we think about our students talking about separation of powers, they can see that as a part of the system of federalism from national state to individual rights. And I think the way you put it is important too, right? Because the anti-federalists are thinking, well, we're citizens of states first. States protect our rights. States protect our liberties. We have duties to them, so we should trust the states. Um, but we now kind of think of the Bill of Rights differently because as you said, Curry, it's Congress shall not do what? Uh, you know, restrict freedom of speech, freedom of religion, et cetera, right? So that's kind of where the Bill of Rights ends up. So last but not least, um, somebody using the Bill of Rights to ensure justice for all, Martin Luther King. And the letter that we look at is one of my favorites, letter from a Birmingham jail. And I think, I love it so much because it wraps in the Declaration of Independence. So it brings us a whole 360 all the way around to this idea of living up to these principles that we should believe in and have we lived up to them. But this is a letter to other religious leaders in the country saying, no, you have to get in in this game. You have to do something because this is the right way to go. This is the where we need to go. So can you walk us through the ideas behind this and the kind of the impact it had at the time? Yeah. And I, I should have said this earlier, but I think it's, I, I love pointing out that it's, it's like Frederick Douglass's July 4th, oration from 1852 mm -hmm. in the sense that both Douglas and then Martin Luther King over a hundred years later are making a similar move. And that move is to say, we believe in the Declaration of Independence. We believe in the constitution and its guarantees, its rights, its ideals, its protection of equality for all. 
but we're challenging you to live up to that because we don't think that you've done so, right? And both, by the way, we're also speaking to religious leaders. They, that was part of that audience, right? Is you believe in this, you should do better. And I think as we talked about earlier, it's Luther, uh, Martin Luther King's argument, a big part of it is all these critics are coming in and criticizing the movement and saying, we're doing too much, we're being too bold. And he's saying, no, it's a moderate position because my position is based in American history and ideals and our founding values. I'm not doing anything extreme. No, 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 I'm, I'm holding on to those things, right? Whether it's Jefferson or Lincoln or even uh, Thomas Aquinas, right? Um, because his argument is we know that some laws are immoral, they're unconscionable. And Americans, some of their natural rights and ideals have always been that there's some actions and laws that are simply unconscionable, that no one should follow, right? And so therefore we should treat Jim Crow the same way we treated Nazi Germany or any other clearly immoral laws. We can't ask people to go away from their conscience and not do so. And, and King's other point is that this is a, this is a peaceful movement, right? It's on the basis of direct nonviolent confrontation. And King's idea here, right, is this is a process, right? We confront people, but without violence in order to start a process of change towards uh, a better reflection of justice according to founding principles, right? That's his, that's his whole big thing, right? And that's, I think, this amazing kind of 360 of saying, again, if these rights aren't protected, if governments do not succeed of doing what they are charged to do, you can push back. You can either say the law is unfair, unjust, or you can uh, absolve the government as a whole. Back to that declaration. Now, students, we are gonna wrap up and do a few Q&A questions at the end, but if you have any more questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will answer them. But with students that new need the jump, good luck on your test, you will do awesome. And we'll send you a few other documents to help you prep and a few other videos to help you prep as well. Nicholas, thank you so much. I am gonna officially stop the live stream now so we can do Q&A.